Welcome everybody to the Digital Finance Seminar Series. This is the third seminar that we have in this series. And just as a reminder, this is being organized by the Columbia Center for Digital Finance and Technologies in the School of Engineering and uh, the Digital Finance Labs at the Business School. So my co-organizer, co Siamak Maleni, is also here and is helping with the series. And today, we are very pleased to have uh, <coughs> Professor Alec Saivinsky uh, from Yale Economics. And uh, I mean, Ali is a very well-known economist. He has made a number of very important contributions, uh, in, like optimal taxation. And uh, like I know him uh, for his recent work on um, fintech, I would say, or economics. And uh, he has very interesting papers on uh, the economics on fungible problems, which is what he will be presenting today. And he's written also other important papers on uh, like uh, the asset pricing implications of uh, energy, etc. So, uh, without further say, I would like to leave the floor to Ale so that he can go ahead and uh, proceed with this talk. Thank you, Ale. Thanks so much for, for inviting me here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's such a beautiful building. Many folks are very interested. I love this collaboration between the engineering, the, the business school, the econ. So it's, it's very nice. It's also great to see some of the, some of the old, uh, old friends uh, whom I unfortunately don't see as often as, as, as I should. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Nicola Bore, who is at uh, Lewis, and Yukon Liu, who is, who is at uh, Rochester. And uh, this paper came about from <clears throat> uh, us uh, trying to, uh, to pivot a little bit from understanding the cryptocurrency markets as a part of the alternative asset space and thinking about the, the non-fungible tokens or, or NFT. So uh, this is a somewhat revised version of the working paper, which we're revising for Journal of Finance. So it's going to be a nice for us to test drive it for, uh, for, for this audience. So what we want to do is we want to understand what are the NFT is, and in particular, what drives the NFT market. And one of the fundamental things uh, that uh, we're interested in is trying to create an index of non-fungible uh, tokens. One can say, well, what's difficult in creating the index of, uh, of NFTs? And the answer is in, its, uh, in the name of NFTs, the non-fungible tokens. Each one of them is different. So how do we put them together? How do we see something that drives the market overall? Once you have the index and once you have some understanding of this market, we can talk about the properties of it, the properties of the index, the properties of the market itself, the properties of the investors, and trying to connect it to a bunch of the theories which deal with other, which dealt with other classes of non-fungible assets and to test them and to see them within this new laboratory of non-fungible uh, non fungible tokens. All right, so let me just have a, a brief uh, preview of the, of the results. If I stand here, it's going to be complicated for you to, to tape me, or it's okay. All right, so, so first we're going to look at the repeat sale regression. So what repeat sale regression does it allows you to create an index, not that dissimilar from the index one uses, one uses in real estate to understand the drivers of the real estate market, the Case-Shiller index being the most, the most famous one. We can talk about the properties of it, what return of it is, uh, what uh, the sharp ratio of it is, what volatility of it is. We can also talk about the variety of predictions uh, for the different uh, models which deal with non-fungible assets. We can talk about the degree of market segmentation. We find that NFT market is rather segmented. Uh, we can talk about the characteristics that drive the pricing, the pricing in this market. In particular, we're going to uh, create some measures of rarity. We can talk about the investor characteristics, who buys different, uh, different tokens and how the characteristics of the investors coincide or correlate with price. <coughs> we can talk about the models with search friction, so degree of st standardizability of the assets and how these models can pan out in the NFT markets. So and then we'll talk about more 
asset price and ideas for this market, in particular, whether one can uh, get any predictability, either in time series or, or in the cross section. There's going to be a bunch of different things about, about which I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about, so please feel free to jump in and, and ask uh, the questions at any given time. So let me first start with data and methodology. So we like to do everything comprehensively. And what we first aim to do is to create the most comprehensive, you know, at this stage, um, a data set of NFT transaction. So we'll look at almost all, actually, in fact, all of the major marketplaces or almost all of the, all of the exchanges, and we'll look at essentially every transaction that occurred on this marketplace. So there's a CryptoKitties, Gods Unchanged, Decentraland, OpenSea, Atomic. We have a bunch of other smaller ones, but these are the major ones. We have about 20 million transactions uh, that cover you know, pretty much everything that is gettable uh, in you know, a real, relatively straightforward way. We also have spent an enormous amount of time of cross-checking these transactions directly with, with blockchain. If you're interested, I can, talk, I can talk about this, trying to validate them. We aggregate them, and we'll look at trades in a variety of, uh, of, uh, of um, currencies, or cryptocurrencies. Can you inform me, is there a lot of short selling in these NFTs? Like Virtually not. <laughs> so essentially, as long as there's a one person who wants to pay a certain amount for an asset, that's going to be the price. There's Pretty much. Yeah, so there, is, there are some solutions which try to do short selling. But uh, basically, they are geared towards very visible assets. Like if you own a collection of <clears throat> bored apes, like super min bored apes, you can probably try to try to short sell some something like this. But it's going to be very expensive. So I don't think it's actually even even feasible. How do you deal with wash trades? Um, yeah, it's difficult. You can't. I mean, you can probably do something more sophisticated. Yeah. So. The answer is no. We don't. We don't deal with them. We could, in principle, do do with them. We can deal with them, and we have some expertise. Or Nicola Bori, my colleague, has expertise of doing wash trades across different exchanges. There's a lot of them. Is it a big problem? I have no idea. So that, that we don't know. But that's, that's a good question. Is there a reason why you are not including super rare? That's like a major exchange. For yeah, we we'll, we have super rare as well. Uh, I forgot exactly what the details were. I think super rare. The API for Super Rare was uh, was kind of complicated, <coughs> funky. So it was up or down, and they, they changed something with uh, with uh, the API. Um, Will Gotsman, uh, my colleague at Yale, I think he uses Super Rare and has a detailed study on Super Rare. Uh, but I thought there was like an issue with the API to do it to do it continuously. That was that was my impression, but I forgot exactly. What is the aggregate value of the NFTs? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to this because it's also like, you know, at, at, at the peak of it. At different times, but are we talking about $10 billion? Are we talking about a trillion dollars? Um, so the, the average transactions now on OpenSea are about $200 million per month. And they're probably... The average transactions... The, the, average transa the average monthly volume of transaction is about $200 million. That's volume, that's not the aggregate value. So I, can, I guess I can, I can show you the index, and we can multiply that index by roughly the volume to get it. Uh, but I, I don't know offhand the, the, answer, the answer for this. All right. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, so once we create this data, I can spend more time on how exactly, how exactly we do it. What I'm going to try to do is um, I'm going to have sort of different spotlights on different things I may be interested in, to just to give you an idea of what NFT is. NFTs may be. And uh, they're going to be somewhat unstructured on purpose because I want to try to be comprehensively tell you about potentially different approaches so one can understand this one. So the very first thing one could do is just to run a hedonic regression. So for those of you who may not necessarily know what hedonic regression is, hedonic regression basically just tries to do the following. You have a price and you run it on a bunch of characteristics. So Z is a characteristic and beta is provides you the estimate of the effect of that characteristic on the price. So this is like super plain vanilla idea of trying to connect 
the value of or the price of an asset to something which is which is observable. So nothing, nothing complicated or nothing, nothing tricky with it. So we're gonna have different angles of the uh, of the hedonic regression. So first we're gonna just look at the whole sample, and we're gonna look at time, currency, collection, and repeated sale dummies. So for example, is it the case that you know one of a condition on the collection? we get a better explanation of the variance of the returns. Do we explain better the price, the price of the returns? Then we're gonna look at the creator sample. We're gonna try to add creator characteristics. And for the creator characteristic, we're gonna add either the identity of the artist, which is the artist dummy, or we're gonna add the royalty fee. So whether the price of an asset changes with the royalty fee that is charged for this asset. What is the question you're asking? I actually am not asking any questions. So I think, okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be um, um, you know, a little, um, so, so I'll tell you what I'm interested in. So there is this thing which is NFT. I'm trying to understand what it is. And I'm gonna try to understand, there are different ways how to understand what it is. One can think you know, from the theory point of view, which is more natural to me, or one can try to see what the data can tell us about this market. Like for example, it's an interesting question on its own to see whether there are some characteristics that are priced or not priced in, uh, in the market, whether it's valuable or not valuable. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a bunch of theories which people have looked at for different other assets which uh, differ in terms of characteristics, and I'm gonna connect to the theories of it. So the paper is called The Economics of NFTs, and the idea is to try to have the market via its pricing information tell us about what it is with the idea that you know, if it talks like a duck, walks like a duck, then maybe it's a duck, or maybe it's not a duck. So, so I guess that's the answer of what the question is, so. All right. Um, and then I'm gonna do also some NFT characteristics. I'm gonna show you how to look at some rarity scores, how rare uh, different NFTs are, and trying to see whether this rarity somehow is correlated with, uh, with the prices of the assets. All right, let me just also, to warm us up and show you some cool pictures, just, uh, just uh, look at how to measure NFT rarity. So how do we measure NFT rarity? We can look at the number of different traits. I'm gonna show you what the traits are, sometimes they're called layers as well. We're gonna look at how many NFTs of uh, this type are in a collection and how many NFTs have a particular uh, feature or, or attribute. So this is an example. So the BAYC is a Bored Ape Yacht Club. So this is a very famous NFT collection. Does any of you know how much this thing cost? No? It's a 100K. So this one is 100K, so I checked. I uh, checked yesterday. So this is uh, this is the board ape three two three two eight four three eight two four. Actually, I mistyped the first. Actually, three hundred k. So it's different. Has different set of characteristics. Yeah. And like if you talk more about it, I defer. But do you know identities of buyers? Yeah. Well, well I'll show by you exactly. By name or just by ID? By ID. I'll, I'll show you. Know, you. What, what I'm always, I think, what quite some of us are worried. We can start an NFT. We can issue, say, hundred of these. Yeah. We can be buying from each other in some way, yeah. it generally doesn't cost us anything. And if someone else wants to buy it, good for us, right? Because we create some sort of price movement and perception that it's valued. Nobody can, we control the supply, right? So do you There have is a little bit of a cost for this as well. Yes, because, because, every, every... Cost. So because, you know, like, I've interacted with some of the folks in the space and I know that some people are doing that. Yeah. Right? Oh, so, uh, no question, a bunch of people so are doing that. So trying to understand whether your return and identity data could shed light to what it says. I'm gonna show you some. Gonna, we'll have the data on identity and I'm gonna show you some, uh, so, some ideas of this, uh, of, this, of this as well. But I agree with this. So this is certainly, I'm sure it's certainly there and there is pretty much no way for us. Now obviously there is a cost, otherwise everybody would be doing it up to a point. Right? Yeah. Some cost. Well, well, yeah, there's cost also in just doing this. You can do many other things as well. Yeah. All right, so uh, the Board API Club has uh, about 10,000 NFTs, uh, and they are randomly created on the basis of different layers and different, different traits. So this particular org, so let me first talk about the Board API Club. So it has the, the, the layers or the traits are eyes, 
Background, fur, mouth, clothes, hat, and earring. So this one has robot eyes, a yellow background, fur cream. Uh, the mouth is bored, unshaven, unshaved dagger, and it has the rainbow, a rainbow suspenders. It's pretty cool uh, board ape uh, in general. It doesn't have uh, the hat or, or the earrings. Uh, so it's important to know that not uh, all NFTs have all seven traits. Um, and each trait has potentially several, several variations. So the first thing I'm going to do is something, you know, absolutely, uh, absolutely simple. I'm going to do the trait ratio. Trait ratio is basically how many of the traits does this NFT have? And I'm, in particular, so this one has five out of seven traits. And uh, that's going to be the trait, the, the trait ratio. Okay. So the second thing, I'm going to create some kind of rarity score. So there are some formulas here, but really what you need to understand is the following. What we want to do is we want to try to understand what is the proportion of all of the board apes that have a particular, particular feature. Suppose you have only 10, a, 10 uh, apes with uh, robotic eyes, and there are 10,000 of them, and the rarity score is going to be just 10 over 10,000. And uh, so the rarity percentage and the rarity score is going to be just the flip of it. So suppose you run this regression, you conclude that attributes A, B, and C in such proportion are the ones that give the highest price. Suppose that's what you learn from the regression like that. And come to Meg and you say, those get the highest price with those characteristics. I will produce another one of this characteristic. Yeah, so typically... So you don't think about this in equilibrium to the extent that regression informs you that certain attributes drive higher prices, then Tomek will come along and produce NFT with these attributes. So, so I hear you, and you know, typically, so Tomek is busy thinking about one right now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so look, so let me tell you. Actually, busy thinking about it for a year. So, so typically, this is the game I would I would play, right? So typically, I would think about the theory and I would think about how the thing works. Here, I actually want to play exactly the opposite game. So what I'm going to do today is pure tabulation, if you want. I'm just going to give you a bunch of different things which may or may not be consistent with, uh, with the different theories, different ideas. Maybe make you think Tomek about something. Maybe make you think about some, some other things. But it's interesting to first learn some stylized facts. And then we can you know, theorize about them and maybe show you what's consistent and what's not consistent, what's important and what's not important. So think about the first step, and hopefully we'll generate uh, some of the interest. We have done something like this before, you know, reasonably successfully with cryptocurrency, where with cryptocurrencies, where we just said, well, what are the basic characteristics of cryptocurrency? Like, for example, what is a sharp ratio? We can write a million theories, but if we don't know what the sharp ratio is, or for NFTs, what if we don't know what even the index of NFTs are? So for Tomek, it's close to his heart because a real estate exactly works like this, and before you had case Shiller index, you can't really talk about the overall the overall market. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a bunch of different things. I'm going to be jack of all trades. Hopefully, you'll find some of them interesting, uh, but maybe not not all of them. But I'm going to be master of none probably. All right. So let's just do some of these calculations. So uh, let's do the eyes. It's a robotic eyes. So there are 350 apes with this eye, with this eyes. There are 10,000 apes. So the rarity percentage is 3.5, and the rarity score is 28.6. Uh, uh, so, Eric, do you also look on other attributes, like who is promoting these deals? No. Like, you know, who is tweeting about that? Because, you know, having Kim Kardashian yeah. saying, I just bought that, you know, it has a big value. It's kind of like for the underwriters, promoters of these deals. So, so th that, that actually is a very good point. We don't, we didn't do it. Maybe we should actually do this. We'll look a little bit about, um, uh, we'll look a little bit at the NFT attention because we found for crypto that attention was important, but it's going to be with a much cruder measure. The problem with this, we'll have to create some stuff on, on uh, like either Reddit or on Twitter, and that's much more time intensive than just looking at some kind of market characteristics like, like this. But maybe it actually would make sense to look at the, at the influencers. Yeah, but we have not. But that we have not done. All right. So, so this is how the scores look like. So, robot cream, yellow suspenders, unshaved dagger. So there are five out of seven trades, but no hat and no and no earring. 
so the rarity score for this is uh, 493. And typically, a higher value of rarity score, and we'll see this in the regression, is going to be associated with a less common or more rare NFT part of the collection, and typically it would have a higher price. So just curious, is this a metric used in the market, or is that something you came up we with? We came up with it. It's actually kind of amusing, because uh, folks ask us how to price NFTs. So I'll show you, I can actually price with the index and this, you can price NFTs better. So if you want, this is already like the best valuation tools for the NFTs that exist in the market. So maybe to speak to Gur's question, um, one, one way I think this stuff could be useful is if you're launching a new collection, how rare should you make your attributes? Should you have a really rare attribute or should you not do that? You know? Or how I would be able to price an existing collection. Suppose I want to collateralize my five NFTs. So what would be the value? I mean, I bought them, you know, two years ago. What would be the value of 3824 and 3824? Uh, and I want to, you know, get some money. I don't want to sell them necessarily, but I want to collateralize them. So think about exactly the same thing you would do with real estate. So you have a portfolio of, of real estate, and perhaps you want to collateralize them. So this is, in, some, in principle, not that, not that different. So let me do just some, some basic things. So let me first run the hedonic regression with time, currency, collection, and repeat sale dummies. So interestingly, actually, what, what we have is uh, with uh, uh, the moment we start putting the collection and repeat sale dummies, the R squared, the amount of variability that this regression explains, actually go up to about, to about 80%. So, but with just time and currency dummies, you get about 44% uh, of range. So far, I have not done anything about rarity. I'm going to throw in the rarity later. Um, so <laughs> what does a repeat sale dummy says? That if the, if, uh, the NFT is uh, sold uh, more than once, then it on average has a 9% higher, higher price. Okay? That's kind of interesting to, interesting to know about this. But I think the most important thing here is that the collection attribution is important for uh, pricing, pricing a given NFT. Uh, so now let me look at some of the characteristics of creators. In particular, let me look at uh, the fees that the creators charge. We had a conversation a little bit about, about the fees for the creators today. And the creator done. So the most interesting thing here is that the identity of the creator is very important. For, uh, for, this, for this hedonic regression, it gives you much higher R squared. But, but also for, for the fees, the increase in the fee by 1% increases by 0.05% the, um, uh, the price of the NFTs. So the creator characteristics, the creator dummies are, are important, or potentially are important, but the creator dummy, the identity of the creator is important. Sorry, the currency dummy is... So it's whether it's sold like in Mana, for example, or you know Ethereum, so or the currency, the currency it's being used. Oh, yeah. Why it's yes or okay. so it like, for example, uh, Mana. But Mana also, for example, picks up where you're in the central land or not. So there is some, um, if you want, technical characteristic or or something like that. Are your prices in dollars or in the currency? We we'll do both. But for consistency, you can just create them. It have one common denominator. All right, so now the, um, the rarity scores. So these are, again, so this just speaks about just the, the amount of data we have, the amount of data we created. So we have a sample of about 9 million, 9 million transactions, even when we look at uh, these more detailed rarity characteristics. So we build this rarity score for each individual NFT. NFT. And basically, what you see is, first of all, you get you know, pretty high uh, R, uh, R squared. So, like, if I wanted to have, like, even with the simple hedonic stuff, I wanted to have a zero for NFTs. You know, that's pretty nicely working here. And we see that the more uh, the more common an NFT is, the higher is the trade ratio, the lower is the price, and the higher is the rarity. You have uh, the higher price for. For, for the NFT. Okay, so those are some characteristics uh, from, from the hedonics. All right. Very little additional, additional variation, yeah. One second for the other, but, but it's still significant. 
Okay, so but it's additional variation is relatively relative. Just a clarifying question. Do you distinguish between NFTs that are purely online assets or also have some real world counterparts? You know, no. I could in principle yeah. sell some physical object sell you the ownership of a physical like object. Like a Ferrari. Yeah. And then you can Yeah, we don't we don't break them because I think there are relatively few digi physical, right? Yeah. That's my understanding. I thought it's much there are relatively few digi physical. We thought about this, but then I think it would be like I don't know. Yeah, my, my sense was they also very rare. Like, they're very rare, but it'll be kind of interesting. But I think like Ferrari, then I think Starbucks have tried to do something. But I forget about Starbucks. But certainly like Ferrari, I think did this. But we, we don't have that. But that's a, that's a, that's an important. Uh, well, it's a cool point, I think, to to look at that. Yeah, it's a difference, right? There's a real asset content. There is real asset behind it, and and you can like look at. You can actually see the premium over the real asset. That's yeah. something about. Maybe it can tell you something about this, yeah. But this, I think, much less common. So most of these things are just literally generated by I put together different things, I put them put them together. The central line is kind of I'm using so, because maybe that is sort of more, I don't know, it's not digi-physical, but metaphysical. Like you can like, go into a cafe or something like that. There's a bank here. But... Why, why is the number of observation changing? Uh, it's because it depends on for, we cannot construct the NFT characteristics or like the rarity score for some of them. So, yeah, like you need to have like the, the detailed uh, data on the characteristics, the layers. All right, so that was, uh, uh, so that maybe the, 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 what was the question? So as I said, I don't know what the question is, but that was, just one second, but that was sort of the first peak of it. So the first cut one could do is just to run a basic hedonic regression and just try to understand what characteristics may be priced in, in particular rarity, which is an important characteristic. The combination of uh, the traits wouldn't matter because I, I don't know if you've taken that into consideration. Like the first yeah, that's a good question. I could principle run regression where I have the, the, the cross partial on this. Um, maybe we can do it actually. But I don't know the answer to this. But the combination, of tra the, the combination may, may matter, I think. Like if you have like laser eyes and, uh, and a dagger, for example, it's much cooler than just having laser eyes and no dagger or something. Would that also like contribute to the rarity of certain very rare trait because like no other trait exists? So it could. Yeah. It could. Yeah, we just did the. So we did actually four different characteristics. I mean, we captured a little bit of this. We have four different rarity characteristics. Like we look at standard deviation, like how volatile these things are. So they perhaps uh, capture some of this. Oh. That was sort of the first, the first cut of, of my tabulation. Now let me do the second cut of the tabulation. Suppose, uh, suppose you're interested in pricing something non-fungible. I don't know, how many of you own a house? Okay, okay. So, you, so some of you own a house. How, do you, how are you gonna look at the price of a house? I mean, you're gonna go to Zillow and you're gonna type in, in Zillow and it's gonna give you some estimate. Does anybody know how this estimate works? Obviously, Tom, because you probably created this. <laughs> But roughly how it works, and Thomas correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so it's a combination of the Case-Shiller index that tells you, you know, how in your part of know, Westchester or wherever, wherever you live, how the overall market is changing at the zip code level, plus some kind of hedonic characteristics, which is how big your house is, whether it has a pool, et cetera. Roughly, that's the Zillow algorithm. So I showed you the first part of the Zillow algorithm, how to do some hedonic. Now I'm going to show you the second part of the Zillow algorithm. <laughs> which is actually surprisingly more complicated to do, and that's actually a big insight of Case and Schiller, but really a big insight of Bailey, Muth, and Norske, the paper from, from the 60s. So what, the, what is Case Schiller Index? So how many of you know, have heard of Case Schiller Index? Probably all of you, right, or many of you. So the Case Schiller Index is the index of the real estate prices at the US level, at the zip code level, you know, very detailed. Uh, a very detailed index of the prices. So the idea is very simple for creating this index. It just says, let me look at <coughs> the return or the change in price of a house. And let me attribute very simple-mindedly the change in the price of this house to two things. To some aggregate thing, the aggregate driver, and to some idiosyncratic noise. One can do it more sophisticatedly, more complicatedly, but at some very, very basic level, any index is like this, some global driver and some idiosyncratic driver. 
If they are multiplicative, you can just basically separate them. If you, if you take logs, and you can just run the change in price, which is the return, on the change of the index loss idiosyncratic noise. And you can back out from the repeated sales because for the change in price you need to have a repeated sale. You can just back out the overall driver, which is the global driver, which is going to be the index. I don't know, it's a, it's a very simple insight of, you know, Case, Schiller, or Bailey, uh, Muth, and Norsky, <clears throat> but at some level it's very aesthetically beautiful. If you, if you think about this, and what we're going to do is we're going to do exactly the same thing, but for NFTs. So we're going to say that the price of each individual NFT consists of two components, some overall driver, the NFT index, and some idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic thing uh, that is uh, you know, related to NFTs. And then I can combine them if I want. I look at that equation. It looks like the beta to the, um, the index is always one. Yeah. Well, you can do it more sophisticated than this. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, but, this is, but this is literally a case in Schiller. And then, you know, there's a case right here, the adjustment, but you can do it more sophisticatedly. And uh, the fee prime are rules transaction times every time there is a That's right, that's right, transaction times, and one could also account for the difference between the, trans the, the difference in time between transactions, you know. And there's a large, well-developed literature, as you would imagine, uh, on how to build case Schiller indexes properly. And the reason to, to use this method for NFTs because so okay, so so that's that, that's, let me talk about this. That's a good question. Why? And that's exactly why. Why do we use this math? <coughs> so what do people in the industry do when they talk about the indices for NFT market? They're gonna so the predominant is to look at some basic statistic characteristics, like for example, at the floor price. And then say, well, the floor price of this other collection or the floor price, average floor price, you know, went up or went down. Let me give you a parallel for why this is junk. Or politely say, statistically indistinguishable from noise. Suppose I'm interested in the price of uh, housing in Manhattan. And I'm interested in a relatively short interval, say, minute by minute. Suppose that today, a giant penthouse on Columbus Circle uh, is sold, and the minimal price in that apartment complex in Columbus Circle is $15 million. So it will be one floor price. And then, I don't know, there is like the garage here that I parked in. It probably is less uh, you know, beautiful as the penthouse in Columbus Circle. And say the minimal price in the garage for the parking space there is like 20 grand. So you will have these fluctuations which are determined by the characteristics of what exactly is sold. So in the housing market, uh, you know, the floor indices are typically just you know, look like garbage. And in fact, here they're also gonna look indistinguishable statistically from random noise. The same for mean and for median prices. They just don't look great. So you may wanna do this. So the alternative is either to use the hedonic regression, which I already have done for you for some characteristics, or to use the repeat sale regression to try, try to back out the overall index. So what we're going to create is we're going to create this repeat sale index, but for the NFT market. And that's basically what it is. So here, the number of transactions are also changing because we need to have repeat sales uh, here as well. And if we look at the full sample, the index explains about 26% of uh, variation of, of the prices for all of the NFTs. If you look at the individual collections, the R squared is much higher. For soup dogs, it's like 90%. For board tapes, it's 90%. So it means that, uh, so if you do the parallel with the real estate, the parallel with the real estate is that the prices in Manhattan, or the, ha the housing price in Manhattan are driven by the Manhattan-specific uh, you know, fluctuations, and then by other stuff as well, but that's a relatively, a relatively small percent. Do you have a sense how stable the coefficients are? So suppose I would run that model for a certain period of time, and I still track the aggregate frame, but yeah. how much, like for out of sample? You could we, we did it for a bunch of out of samples, so because the first version of this paper was, uh, was written for, I think, until, I forgot, like, uh, <coughs> until March of... Uh, 2022, or maybe like January of 2022, January 2022. And then for the revision, we just recalculated everything. 
So it changed a little bit for the full sample, for the individual samples, but roughly, roughly is the same. If you start slicing, like if you say do the outliers, like the big you know, drops, maybe there the stability is different, but at least for these two parts of the sample, it, it's, 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 it's roughly the same. Do you know what it is for the case Schiller for like R squared? It's, it's pretty good. You can get easily north of 80%, 90%. But at zip code level, right? Yeah, but individual property level will have a margin uh, of error when you try to predict. That's right. Between 3 to 7%. Yeah, so you can think about Bored Ape as being like a neighborhood. Like, you know, I don't know, Manhattan or Upper East Side or Upper West Side. But overall, I don't know what overall it is for real estate, but my guess would be also in this magnitude. Okay. So this is how the, the market index is. I think it's calculated until, up until yesterday. Uh, so if you're interested, we have like a little website we put together called BLT Index, which is Borel, Liu, and Savinsky. And it also has a nice mnemonic BLT, so who doesn't like BLT? So you can look up web data. We try to update it every couple of weeks uh, with, with the new data. So this is how the market index looks like. So went up, it went down, eh, not quite crashed. I mean, we'll see whether, <laughs> whether it's going to asymptote to zero or maybe pick up again. Uh, but this is uh, the, the overall index for, for NFTs. Now it's actually gonna, I'm using to look at the individual collections. And we have the sub collections track the index pretty well. So the CryptoKitties, for example, track the index quite well. CryptoPunks just took off and uh, still you know, higher than the index. Um, the central land roughly looks like the index, maybe shifted a little bit. Bored apes uh, are driven differently from, uh, from the index of the full sample, but uh, uh, yeah, but they're driven differently but from, from the full sample. All right, so let me talk about summary statistics. So um, you know, I have an additional hat to compare to my macro theory stuff that I do. I like empirical asset pricing. And I like to summarize everything in terms of the you know, risk return characteristics at the very simple level. So this is uh, the risk return characteristics for NFT. Uh, and the mean is, so this is weekly. This is 1% per week, 14% standard deviation, 0.494 sharp ratio. NFTH is heteroskedasticity adjust, we're gonna talk about this. And then I have two other reference, uh, reference numbers, which is the coin market, coin market, which is our own index that uh, you can, uh, and I, and she will create it for, uh, for the index of the individual coins, crypto coins, or cryptocurrencies. <coughs> and uh, you can compare, say, the, the sharp ratios for this, and just for the normal market. So the normal market, for example, has lower volatility, lower returns, but uh, you know, roughly comparable sharp ratios. And this is uh, the behavior of the index over different, uh, different time periods, different quarters, uh, and we have data from 2018 to, uh, to 2022. So maybe this is part of the answer of wh what is the question? And the simple, one simple question is, what is the index of this asset, even though each individual asset is very varied, but we can talk about the aggregate behavior uh, of the of the index. All right. Yeah, if you don't know say the stock market, you don't estimate mean return over two years. Because volatility is a very good question. Okay, so I'm not. I thought that I actually disagree with it for very simple for very simple reason. If you have a market with higher volatility. So if you can think about volatility related to time as a square root, suppose you know, there's a diffusion driving it. So a market with higher volatility, it's as if the market where life is, is much faster, okay? it's as if we speed up market. So in fact, you can think about having this relatively short time period as being much longer if we look at it, if we scale it into normal volatility. So at least it's, it's a partial answer uh, to your question. All right, so I also like to think about how does this market behave compared to the other markets. The, the simple, one simple way to look at this is just to look at the exposures. Does it co-move together with other known assets? So the first thing to compare with is, does it co-move with the coin market? So the coin market, so there is certainly a correlation with coin market, and the correlation is about uh, 50%. And also we can do the same thing, but conditional on, in fact, our own 
uh, moment on our own factors, the size and the momentum factor that we have found previously to be important in the in uh, pricing of the of the uh, of the cryptocurrencies, and uh, you know, roughly you get uh, the the strong co movement with with the coin market in terms of the value, but the R squared is thirteen percent. So there is a bunch of the variation that is unexplained by the coin market. So NFTs co move, but the variation is only uh, but only thirteen percent of the variation is explained by or. Uh, is uh, yeah is explained by the by the coin market. <laughs> Let's look at the correlation with the traditional market. So there is a correlation with uh, the the stock market, and that's that's the top. And then there are a bunch of other uh, factors that typically are found to be important for price and price in the stock market. You, know, you have pretty low R squared. Uh, so there is some commune, the statistically significant, but uh, the NFT market is driven probably by, as this suggests, by different factors than either the coin market, the crypto market, or the stock market. So when you look at this, uh, you should uh, at least have one answer for why the NFTs may be useful. If I have an asset which is traded and which is poorly correlated or have low exposure to the traditional asset class or a traditional asset class also include the cryptocurrency, then I would say that it's a valuable asset. I should have it in my portfolio. I can, in fact, calculate how much I should have in my portfolio. I haven't done it here. Uh, but I may have some, um, um, I may need or may want to have some exposure to, to NFTs. So. Question. The coin market, what is the crypto market, the stock market, and the coin market. <laughs> so the coin market is basically our, it's our own index of the, the valuated index of 1,800 coins. I see. So these are like big coins and others. So 1,800 coins. So 1,800 coins. So we just, I mean, we just like to use our own index. What's we, the difference with the crypto market? It's the same thing, but just broader. Larger it's larger number of coins. It's better done. It's you know super cleaned. So we basically use this for our journal of finance paper, and it's just it's just well done, broad index of the markets. So think about this as you know we'll share five thousand, but for crypto. All right. How much time do you have, by the way? Thank you. You still have uh, twenty minutes. Oh, twenty minutes. Okay. Excellent. I don't know what I'm going to finish, but we're going to just you know see a bunch of other interesting things. All right, so let me look at some of, the, some of the testable predictions. So what we have done, especially for the revision of this paper, because we actually asked some of these questions, is like, what's economics here? What is the economics of the NFT market? So we said, okay, let's look at essentially the universe of the theories of non-fungible assets, in particular real estate, search markets, et cetera, and see whether for this laboratory where we have Quite, quite nice data, quite detailed data for the new asset class, perhaps. What are the implications of these models and how do they play out in, in, the, in the NFT markets? Just again, get an idea of what this market, market may be. Okay, so uh, this is a question about, about wallets and identity of the buyer. So we have done a massive additional you know, data exercise where I collect wallet IDs of buyers and sellers for each NFT transaction. And we're in particular interested in uh, the concentration, if you want, of the portfolios of uh, uh, the buyers and how, uh, whether they're concentrated in each individual collection, whether they're concentrated among certain small number of buyers. And that is how they also diversified or undiversified. So, for example, so this is a buyer with wallet ID uh, ending with 59AA. I don't know who that person is. I could probably track, track that person, but I didn't. So that person bought 11 NFTs and was active for six weeks of 2022. And uh, that person pur purchased five mythical origins, one Fairer Gods, one Molly, the influencer, Molly, the NFT official, and Molly secret collection. So uh, in this case, five out of 11, that's the collection ratio is 45%, are held in the top collection. And we'll also see what sellers they're buying from. And they bought 
two out of 11 NFTs from the, from the, same, from the same seller. So uh, this is interesting information. We could have probably much richer information. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have to do anything to eliminate certain kinds of wallets that might have been the marketplaces themselves or even like the people issuing them? Yeah, we, we, we just did not get, uh, we, we did, we, so we, did not, we were aware of this. We did not do this. Um, it's very, very time intensive exercise and effort intensive exercise. Uh, Nicole has done a bunch of this for crypto across different exchanges. Uh, Makarov and Antoinette Shore have a recent paper when they try to do a bunch of this elimination to carefully look at, uh, at the structure of the network of the buyers and sellers for crypto. We probably want to do something like this at some point of time, but we, we just have not done it. I mean, for this, you need to have, we try to like pick the, lo the lower hanging fruits. I mean, for this, you need to have like, a bunch of arrays and we just don't like to have arrays. We just like to do everything ourselves. All right, so this is, uh, this is just an example. We have 10,000 buyers, 100,000 uh, buyers, which cover about 58 total transactions, 58% of total transactions, 100,000 buyers. And the bottom line is that um, they have concentrated portfolios. So most of the buyers hold 30% of their portfolio in one collection. So they board ape. And they buy from quite a lot of them, 7% from a single seller. And we do some other things which are, which are, which are interesting, but perhaps uh, less, uh, less fundamental. We adjust for the number of collections. Well, what is the barrier of entry to produce NFT? Well, first time, uh, then a bunch of them are not bought, and then to list them actually it costs it costs something. You know, the question is how, how expensive it is, but I'm asking because the next question is what is the return risk uh, uh, profile of somebody who wants to make NFTs given these results? I can give you some some information on uh, the return. I'm not trading them; I'm just making them and then selling them. For an average person, probably very low. What? The re both risk and return is very low. Like I, uh, so, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of NFTs I created, you know, or whatever each week or maybe even each day. And uh, the question is, how many of them are picked up by the market? Many so of them. Are these part of the so whatever is the transaction, yeah. So so for the for the repeat sale, so so this needs to be bought. Okay, so and we'll have a bunch of statistics on the first the first purchase as well. Okay, so this is a, so a bunch of them can be just listed, but those that turn out to be traded. That's right. So, so these are bought. These are the ones which are bought, and hence we have the price for them. But there are a bunch of them which also have repeat sales. Even if say we issue with a bunch of digital monkeys, yeah, one is bought for half a cent. It will be in the center. So all you need is just some transaction. You need some transaction. Uh, we also looked at some data uh, of the listed but not sold. But actually, I'm, I'm, I forgot the details uh, about that. And we, we could probably like, look, look at this. But you know what? You cannot tell. The, the, the nice thing about all this, I think that's what I like this exercise in general, is that the market tells you something about the characteristics because the price somehow aggregates some information about what's important and what's not important. If I don't have a price, I mean, I can probably look at like the cost of creating these things, how long they have been issued, and maybe correlate their characteristics with what has been sold, but we have not done that. We have price. It's zero. It's just, it's just not in your sum. Uh, there's a, uh, the, is maybe it's producing a new NFT. Maybe they have an option value, it's right? Issue, it's just don't buy it stock. No, but not everything that, that is inventory. Not, oh, but inventory has a price, right? I mean, option has a price. I'm talking to people doing this. The big cost is the marketing. You have to pay influencers. Big cost is the marketing. If you want to actually, the IPO be successful in some sense, you know. And plus, of course, there's all the issue of who is hyping it in some sense. Yeah, so, so there is some work in uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, about uh, the success of ICOs and such. They, they looked in more details uh, about this. The initial coin offerings. So one could probably do something like this. But I agree with you. So the cost of marketing to make it successful. Is that Kim Kardashian? She can only push as many of them per day or per week. You know, there is a... Yeah. 
ensuring they lose a brand. Yeah, exactly. So in some sense, like to the highest bidder. But Kim Kardashian, I think, is maybe the uh, the, the the upper level. I don't know. I'm also I'm used by Amazon. How Amazon works. But also, like for promotions, it's suppose you just want to list, I don't know, your uh, whatever you want to sell, you know, like the plastic cups or uh, something. Right? So that also to have you listed among the top 10 of the plastic cups, also expensive. And it's not as expensive as asking Kardashian, but there is expense, expense for this as well. Is there some evidence that, uh, like, if an artist uh, creates a new and means an NFT collection, then probably if he comes up with a new NFT, then it's more likely to be picked up. Yeah, so there, there is some evidence like this. Some people have looked at this within individual collections. Uh, the artist dummy here is important for us as well. Right. And we see this as well. For smaller sets of things, so again, Will Gottman has this very detailed, very nice study on like the properties of the art. He knows how to look at them carefully. He can tell you more beyond this, uh, but you know, for, for, a particular, for a particular marketplace. He has this detailed information about... Uh, artistic value and such things, identity of the artist, what artists are getting. But we, the, so here we are, that's what I said, we're a master, we're jack of all trades and maybe master of none, so we don't get this detailed information, but then we have a much broader data set. And, uh, and, and we get that. All right, so there are a bunch of predictions in the literature about uh, how the, uh, uh, so what may be the impact on the price of, of different different situations. For example, Paul Rosen and John, in particular for the NFT market, they argue that the more experienced investors make higher, um, uh, make higher returns on, on the trades, and in particular, at the ICO level, or the level of the first, of the first purchase and participation in the primary market. There is a beautiful paper by Lova and Spangers, which unfortunately is like, I don't know, not cited very, very highly. But it's a paper about the, it's an American Economic Review paper. It's about uh, the art market, but I think it's much broader about the search models of non fungible assets, which I sort of learned while I was doing this project. But it's a beautiful paper. It's very, very nicely done. And the, the idea there is very simple. So suppose there are two types of folks who are interested in buying the, uh, this non-fungible assets, you know, the bored apes. The first one are the collectors. We just like the bored apes. We want to put them in a frame and, and keep them. And the other one, which are speculators, who want to just flip them, buy and sell them for profit, but don't have emotional <coughs> attachment to the bored ape with a dagger in the, in, in the mouth. And uh, one of the key predictions for the Low and Spangers paper is the following. Then the longer is your holding period, the lower is the return because the only time you would sell is when you're hit by the unexpected, unexpected shock as opposed to you're going to be timing uh, for the sale for the time of the highest return. And finally, Gottsman and Kuhlman have this, uh, no, other people who do this, they have the predictions about under, uh, under diversification among the less sophisticated investors. And we're going to look also at how diversification or diversification is connected to, to the returns. So this is some information. So the more experienced you are, the more you buy, the higher is your return. So the first sale matters. As in Lovo and Spangers, you have the negative return between the holding period. The longer is your holding period, the lower is your return. And uh, the, more, the, uh, the less diversified you are, the uh, lower is your the lower is your return. So it's also a different angle on the question of what the NFT markets are. We'll look at some existing theories of uh, other markets for non-fungible assets, and we see whether the predictions of that hold true, and in particular, in this case, they do for, uh, for the NFT markets. But yeah, when we look at the diversification, taking this regression, the artists. Uh, yeah. You can, for each artist, how many different NFT collections he has purchased? Like, how, how do we measure the diversification? So I could throw in the artist dimes. I don't know how. To, how uh, I don't know the, the results of hand for this. But I could. So so uh, so. I'm trying to understand how how we. Oh, the diversification. So so this is the measures of diversification I talked about. So so think about, for example, um, suppose that uh, you have uh, I don't know pudgy penguins. So you have eleven things in your collection. And uh, 
uh, 11 of them are pudgy penguins. So then you're going to be very, very undiversified. Or how many of them you buy from the, from the top, uh, the top buyer or something like this. So from one temperature buyer. versions, what's on the left hand side? It's return. So you interpret one coefficient here. What does it mean? So the first one on the left, the log of uh, number buying. So this is the number of buyers. So again, so I'll, I'll need to, so the return is higher by 0.22, so I'll need to, to convert this to return, I'll need to convert it, I'll need to know the standard deviation, but I forgot, I'll have it for the next slide for other things, but not here. But I can tell you for, I don't know, like for other things I could convert this for you to, the return is higher by the certain amount, but I don't, since I didn't report the standard deviation here, I cannot convert it to you directly. So here I just want to say that the more experienced you are, uh, whether it's uh, where you're making the return, the longer is the gap between the sales and the less or more diversified you are, whether you're making high or low returns. So forget about the size. So just think about the size at this stage. I could convert for it, but I don't, I don't, I don't remember all. By the time you have 5 million observations, everything is not going to be significant. Not everything. I'm going to show you a bunch of things which are not. Like volatility, for example, is not. As an example. All right. So then, the second thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, the second set of theories I'm gonna look at is a set of theories related to the to the search frictions, asset liquidity holding periods, and uh, most of them have the following underlying underlying idea, which is uh, suppose I have a relatively short holding period. If I have search frictions, the only reason why I would sell it now is if something amazing came about. Suppose I just bought, I don't know, like what's coveted now, like a nice new car, right? I don't know, like a Porsche Cayenne. Okay, and you know, like I waited for them for a year, only if somebody comes to me now and says, I'm gonna pay you double for it, or like, you know, like a Rolex Submariner, it's a good example. Somebody buys, uh, uh, if somebody offers me double the price, only then I'm gonna sell it because otherwise I'll have to find you know, exactly the same Rolex Submariner and gonna take a lot of time. So the idea here is that um, in the markets with, uh, with the search frictions, uh, we, have, uh, we have a positive intercept, meaning that even at the very short horizon, we'll be able to make, uh, to make positive returns and the volatility also doesn't go down to zero as it would be in the case of the, of the diffusion model. So here we try to test this and we're looking at the holding period and we're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the log returns and we're looking at the standard deviation of them to try to figure out whether there is a, a positive intercept. A court or that is consistent with the with the search friction. So I'm five more minutes. I want to show you a couple of other things which are kind of interesting. I think this one I like I like quite a lot, which is the next the next slide, which is um, I want to understand in what sense this uh, assets are the non fungibility of this assets is important. There's a very nice paper by Anton Soy, who is now at uh, Toronto, who develops a pretty sophisticated model of search and bargaining for, again, for non-fungible assets. And then he argues that the more standardized assets are more valuable because it's easier for you to find a replacement for them. The search friction, the search costs are gonna be, are gonna be lower. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna look at our hedonic regression. We're gonna look at the residual from the hedonic regression. And we're gonna see whether this more standardized assets are more valuable because the search frictions for, for, them, for them is lower. And we find this, maybe with the exception of the, of the third uh, quantile, uh, where we'll look that uh, the more standardized assets sell faster, at least in this, uh, in this simple matrix, which is also consistent with some of this uh, search theories. All right, um, let me go show. how much time do you have? Five minutes? Yeah, five more minutes. Uh, let me skip the, the volume part, which is kind of amusing, but I want to see uh, also like the big chunk of the things for uh, whether we can think about NFTs as, if you, if you wish, an investable asset. So what are the properties 
uh, of return predictability and the cross-sectional asset price and properties for, for NFTs. So we looked at a bunch of candidates, but in particular, we looked at the things which potentially are priced in cryptocurrencies and which may or may not be priced in NFTs. The volatility, the valuation ratio, which is the index to transaction, which captures some form of network effect, the attention, the momentum and reversal, and volume. And actually, even in this large sample, a bunch of the, the things are potentially not significant. For example, if we look at the return predictability and volatility at the one to four week horizon, volatility is not significant, but it's significant on the five to eight uh, week horizon. So in here, I actually do the conversion for you is that a one standard deviation in volatility leads to, or is correlated with a 14.8 decrease in cumulative NFT market return at eight week uh, horizon. So during the times of high volatility, the delayed response if you want on the eight week horizon. What's the inversion here? What's on the left hand side? It's on the left hand side is the return at T plus eight, for example. And uh, so on the. It's on the cross section. Right? I'll show the cross section as well. In a second. So all we can do also the valuation ratio. And uh, you have, so what we try to capture here is, the, is something of the equivalent of the price to, um, uh, price to equity ratio, or price, sorry, price to earning ratio. And uh, here, since you don't have earnings, what we're trying to capture is the index to the transaction with the idea of capturing some kind of value of uh, different NFTs as uh, measured by the volume of the transaction. And we see that these are these are significant. So one third deviation in log of this value index leads to 19% decrease in cumulative NFT return set NFT at the five week horizon. Attention, which actually was quite surprising for me because attention is so important in the in the cryptocurrency markets. Attention actually, at least the attention in the simple way, which is done by the Google searches on NFT, crypto, and Bitcoin, that's actually not important or not priced which is very different, say, for example, for cryptocurrency market. Uh, there is some evidence of the serial dependency or a reversal in the time series of, of, the, of the NFTs as well, but it's not statistically significant. Maybe because we just have relatively few observations. And uh, the volume, volume is important. So now let me show you briefly in the cross-section. And in cross-section, we're interested in cross-sectional predictability and we're interested in some other effects that we have found either in crypto. In the cryptocurrency market, people have found more broadly in other asset classes, in particular in the size effect and in the momentum effect, which are the two important, um, the two important factors for price and the, the cross-section of the, of the asset prices. So here we have many more observations. And here what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture what the return uh, or cool moves together with the size of uh, the coin and what we see is that the larger coins, so the double in the NFT purchase price is uh, associated with 0.5% decrease in the weekly returns. Okay, so this is similar to the size effect in a bunch of the other markets and it's also present in, in, the, in the NFTs. So don't take anything I say as an investment advice, but if you want to put together uh, a collection of NFTs, which is going to do better than the average, put together you know, relatively small NFTs as opposed to buying, buying the masterpieces and expensive NFTs. Is there a big difference between the volume of the, the rare, thus more valuable NFTs versus the more pedestrian ones? The volume of the rare versus uh, the, yeah, like the one the, with the traits? Yeah, like the rarest board ape is going to trade a lot less than more generic one. Yeah. Am I wrong? Uh, so I don't know that. I mean, I haven't run this, but I could probably, it's easy, easy to run this. Right. I'm just curious. I could just like run this, a mix of this with, uh, with some of the uh, rarity characteristics. If that turns out to be true, then does it, does it impact the integrity of results like this? Like it you're going to have a lot more data from the lower value. Than... It could. Yeah, it could. Oh, yeah, you have different collections. So I'm interested also in serial dependence, if you think momentum or reversal. So, and also this is for slightly different, for, for different collection. 
Uh, but uh, for example, here we have that an increase in average weekly return is associated with 0.3 percent in uh, decrease in the in the following weekly returns. Another way to say it is that don't buy the increase in don't take this as an investment advice. Don't buy the increase in NFTs because uh, they will typically 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 reverse. All right, so I think I'm going to end exactly. One of the things according to the repeat sales method, if you buy if you trade more, the price will go up. So that means that uh, if you are buying NFTs, just been you mean with the volume? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you should, yeah. So you should, yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, but the, the price on average. But this is about the cross-section predictability, right? So that's what we're interested in. So there is one thing which is the contemporaneous. So the ones which have been sold have higher price, which are the ones which have not been sold. But the question is whether we can statistically predict returns. All right. So let me just uh, conclude this very quickly, so we uh, we, we finish we finish the talk on time. So what I have tried to do is, uh, I mean, I like this NFT market. Uh, I think it's interesting. Very rarely do we see in the new class of assets come about. We've seen this with crypto. Uh, and I think it's interesting to look at the NFT market. Some people argue that the NFT market is revolutionary. Some other people think it's just a bunch of junk. Uh, so I'm not going to you know, take a stand on this. But if you think it's not junk, it's interesting to know some stylized properties uh, of it. And in particular, that can be potentially a guide to write down different theoretical models to see whether they're consistent with the existing models, what the differences, differences may be. And we have seen you know, during the questions here that uh, some of the things work, some of the things don't work. They're different from the cryptocurrency. They're different from the normal markets. And also, I like this because... Um, I like more broadly non-fungible assets. Real estate is interesting. Commercial real estate is interesting. Art market is interesting. So we have this new thing coming on, on uh, coming in existence, which is this massive amount of detailed information, which we don't have to. If we invest a little bit of time, we can we can get, and maybe we'll learn something interesting about this. So, so that's basically basically the pick. Thank you. Do you think liquidity risk can be actually an important factor to explain actually the returns? Because I can imagine that in the NFT market, trading is very infrequent, and maybe the transaction cost is very high. But I think China is actually super hard to measure. You don't have, for example, bid spread in equity markets. It's kind of very common liquidity measures. But I think that can potentially be maybe a risk factor affecting it, it, it could be. So, so again, so based on our previous work in cryptocurrencies, one has to be careful not about what, what works. Like if you think about, for example, the, the stock market. So there is a factor zoo. So there are you know, 156 different facts that have been found to be pricing the, the returns of different assets. And probably one could group them in different categories. Actually, it turns out that a bunch of them don't work for, for cryptocurrencies, or those that work are subsumed by size, momentum, momentum, um, uh, and, uh, the, and the value. For example, one could think about size as a proxy for liquidity. The reason why I have return on smaller size stocks, coins, NFTs is because they are less liquid. And we made this point, we made this point before. One could try to measure the more directly the liquidity impacts. And we have done it in our previous work. We have not done it, done it here. You can look at Amihood liquidity measures or something like this, a bunch of other indicators of liquidity. Um, we have found previously that they were subsumed by the size, the size factor as well. My guess it would be probably to some extent as well here. Yeah, yeah I just... Um... Will this, will this video be available for us to, to yeah. see in the slides? Yeah, we will post the video on the, on the website of the, um, where all the seminar series is being. The, where the digital finance yeah, website? Yeah, exactly. You go to the digital finance website, there is a seminar section where you can see all the videos. But you can send out some information as well to the mailing list. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Then. Okay. So this your comparisons to the art market and real estate made me realize something very interesting about NFTs is that unlike those markets, here there's no asymmetric information. 
there are no ape limits that one has to worry about. As opposed to if you're buying a house, who knows what the plumbing is. If you're buying even like physical art, you do have to worry a lot about forgeries. If you're buying a Porsche, did the owner do the oil changes or not? So there's like this interesting dynamic here. Yeah, it could be. Good point. Great. So I think that's again.